Today on the Grave Talks, 232 Birch. Well, before Steve Blackwell moved into 232 Birch, Steve had a childhood dotted with paranormal run-ins, encounters that proved the existence of ghosts and spirits in our world as facts of life. As an adult, Steve and his future wife would begin their lives together at the address of 232 Birch, an address that would leave them wanting to better understand the spirits that cohabitate the world we share. Visits from a little ghost boy, strange noises, and unexplained happenings would lead Steve and his wife to a journey of paranormal discovery. Today on The Grave Talks, the story of Steve Blackwell and 232 Birch. I had a a few different experiences as a child growing up in uh, a small town in Saskatchewan, uh, up here in Canada. And uh, at that time, of course, it was more of a, you know, what I would, you know, call a frightening experience because I I couldn't wrap my head around the paranormal at that time. I didn't understand uh, that, you know, perhaps uh, this energy existed. uh, And, you know, when I started experiencing uh, this type of energy, I almost assumed that everyone kind of had these things happen to them every once in a while. And, you know, so I sort of brushed it off. Uh, I'd say I had three or four different things happen to me as a child that uh, I definitely couldn't explain. And I really didn't have any other experiences until uh, we moved into 232 Birch, which would have been uh, in uh, 94, 1994. And at that time, uh, you know, and I'll be honest with you, Tony, we only had about 12 things happen to us in a nine year period. It was uh, very sporadic, but when uh, this energy seemed to exist, it was really undeniable. You know, my wife and I, uh, as well as my children who were very young at the time, all experienced this energy within uh, our townhouse. And we even had friends come over uh, that, I found out later after discussing my own experiences that they said that there were many times that they were over at the house that they felt, you know, uh, a, a colder presence or, or uh, you know, kind of an uncomfortable uh, EMF kind of frequency that seemed to resonate throughout the house. I had uh, a closet upstairs in our children's nursery that uh, always seemed to have a very cold air in it and there was no vents or anything in it. And it just so happened to be that that was the closet that my son woke up in the middle of the night as a as a toddler screaming and pointing at the closet and saying, Tukey is in the closet. Tukey is in the closet. And and, and I want to get into some of those experiences in the house. And I wanted to have you recount them kind of chronologically as we get to it. Take us back, though, before we even get to to more about the house and take us into uh, some of those those experiences as a child. I know you said you only had like three or four, but but what are some of the more standout ones out of those three or four that when when you look back on, you go, I have no idea what that was. Sure, and I'd have to tell you that the probably the number one thing that stands out uh, out of all the things that happened to me as a child is I was over at a uh, uh, a friend's house. I was probably about six six or seven years old. And I was at a friend's house playing with uh, those little green army men at the top of uh, uh, of their staircase. And at the top of their stairs, they had a linen closet that uh, directly pointed to the, the face of the stairs. And as I played away, that uh, closet door very aggressively uh, swung open. Uh, it was kind of a hinged uh, one, uh, one door frame, that, and it kind of blew open really quick. And, uh, you know, of course, I fell down a few stairs. It it, uh, freaked me out so much that I I didn't know how to explain it. And after that initial blow open of the of the uh, closet, nothing else happened at that point. But we did do some uh, investigation with getting the parents involved and so on, who confirmed that there is no, you know, heating or cooling vents within that uh, closet area. And so, uh, you know, when I told them that this closet had swung open and even showed them as it was still open uh, uh, when I, I brought them to the spot, they they found it hard to believe and actually told me that it was uh, probably myself who, who opened that closet and was making up a story. Uh, and I never, you know, at that time dug into having a conversation with them because of my age about any, you know, energy that they may have experienced within their house. Uh, but that particular house, I had probably two or three 
uh, strange experiences, the first one being the closet uh, incident. What were some of the other ones, if you want to touch on those briefly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there was a time when I was in the same house watching a, a movie with uh, my, my friend. Of course, we're, we're quite young. I lived right across the street at the time. And uh, as we were watching a movie, we uh, saw a, a large shadow uh, kind of come across the, the, the face of the wall. And, uh, you know, we couldn't quite explain where the shadow may have come from. And, and uh, you know, immediately after we saw the shadow, the, uh, the family's cat came running into the living room. And, you know, of course, we made the joke and said, well, you know, we must have missed saw that shadow that must have been the cat but it definitely had a human form to it and it just uh it kind of just moved uh right across the wall you know the curtains in the living room were were closed we we kind of debunked any possibility of there being some sort of reflection uh coming from the street area and uh you know that happened probably two or three months after the closet experience and then I can recall a couple months uh, after that, I was out in their backyard um, camping in in uh, their tent trailer, which was in their back driveway. And we, uh, my friend and I, we also had her brother there at the time. We we can uh, distinctly remember hearing uh, a set of footsteps coming down the the. Uh, sidewalk towards the camper we were sleeping in and it and it was very obvious that there were two people walking there wasn't any communication and uh, it just it was funny because we were out in the camper t- telling each other ghost stories of course and and this started happening and uh, when we poked our head out the door soon after the uh, the footsteps had passed we opened the door and there was just one individual he was actually walking as if he was uh, intoxicated or drunk um, and but it was definitely a different sound, you know, when when we heard him, or you know, visualized him walking. It was a completely different sound that we had heard when he or they were approaching the camper itself. So, you know, those things were very much uh, uh, up in the air as to with, uh, whether they were paranormal experiences or not. But I kind of uh, um, you know put them in the same bucket simply because it all seemed to take place at this particular property. Sure, and, and when you had these things happen, I know you had mentioned you know, it was difficult to talk about something like this when you're a kid to, to an adult, yeah. but what was, what was the, the take on these sort of things from the parents? Were they just continually kind of brushing them off, rationalizing things, or, or were you in an atmosphere where parents were somewhat accepting of, of the paranormal? Yeah, no, and it, it wasn't. Uh, it was. It was basically where they uh, thought that you know these were these were kids being kids, and they were reporting things that you know was part of our imaginations. Uh, I would think, and so uh, you know, being a child at the time, I, I never really pressed into it or tried to uh, you know prove uh, what I had witnessed. So it it basically disappeared uh, as it, as uh, you know something that was a concern, but. Uh, I know that my friend, who is the same age as me, uh, also experienced uh, these things. And, uh, you know, being the age that we were at, again, we were very uh, ignorant as to what this energy... uh, Well, we didn't even realize it was an energy at the time. Of course, we just thought that this was a... You know, these were experiences that maybe everybody uh, has every once in a while. And, you know, we, we... had our stereotypical ghost uh, imaginations. You know, we at that time, a ghost to us was, uh, you know, somebody who had a sheet over their head with eyes cut out, right? And so <laughs> um, experiencing this kind of energy for the first time, it was very difficult to, to wrap our heads around it at, at our age. And anytime we tried to, uh, you know, constitute this with the parents, they just brushed it off. It, it wasn't something that... Uh, that they found was even happening and you know as i as i uh, got more experienced and educated with the paranormal i realized that that energy may have been uh, you know very present at all times within their house but they just may not ha- have not been able to see it themselves sure. and that's when i started realizing that perhaps uh, 
I didn't necessarily have a gift, but I, I think that I had a little bit of a broader spectrum when it came to allowing my mind to open up to see in this kind of energy. Sure. I, kind of, a, I always say like the one to 10 scale, there's, there's ones and there's tens and there's everything in between, depending on uh, yeah, exactly. what, what your sensitivity yeah. is, just like sight and sound and all that. We're all at different levels as far as abilities. Okay. Well, it sounds Absolutely. like, so, so you had some, some perspective there as a child, um, you know, on the paranormal, you had some experiences. It wasn't a foreign thing for you. And then as an adult, right. you you get into this property at 232 Birch. Now, how did how did this begin with, with discovering this property and, and deciding to make it your home? Tell me that story. Yeah, so my wife and I, or my girlfriend at the time, I guess, you know, we, uh, we were living in her little apartment. She had a, a one-bedroom apartment. I had moved away from home and uh, decided to shack up with her. And uh, we, we, you know... Uh, started you know our courtship was was very good and we had decided you know we're gonna be making some longer term plans and so we decided you know to get out of the rental game and 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 buy our own place as a first house at that time we could only afford a a, a townhouse and so we you know we put all of our money together we moved into this house and the very first time we walked into this property with the real estate agent uh, both my wife and I discussed it after the fact. We felt something in that house that was strange, but uh, because we hadn't really had any experience since, uh, well, since I was a child, uh, it wasn't something that we have kind of uh, put together mathematically as being uh, a paranormal energy. But there were just certain things while we did our, our tour of the property that just didn't I don't know. There, there was just a funny, funny feeling you get, and and I know that you could probably attest to kind of what that feeling is like. But uh, we didn't think anything of it. We were really happy with the fact that we could afford this place and call it our own home, um, and it had the space available for it to start to start off uh, our own family. So uh, we we bought the place in uh, 19, uh, January 1994. And we stayed there uh, for about nine years until we decided to move uh, away and come back to Alberta, Canada, which, which is where I grew up. So when you get into the property, you, know, you have a few feelings here and there. But what was what was like the first sign to you that maybe there's something off here? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny that you ask that because the, probably the first sign that I thought things were off had absolutely nothing to do with the paranormal. And that was the, the fact that the... Uh, current owner at the time she had elvis pictures uh all over her walls okay and, and we, we thought okay well that's okay you know i was an elvis fan my my father was an elvis fan uh and that that was okay except for the fact that she literally had uh probably 30 or 40 elvis uh you know paintings and photographs just all smeared all over the house and so we thought well that was a little strange to begin with but uh paranormally uh it was just a an energy you know when they took us up to show us the realtor took us up to show us the spare bedroom opened up the closets that's the first time i experienced kind of an airflow coming from there and i never thought anything of it i assumed that there was probably some sort of a vent or something in the closet that was uh, uh making that happen but uh, there was never any indication presented to us that that the current owner had had any paranormal experiences in there and we had just uh, decided to move in, and everything was very normal, I would say, until probably the second or third month that we were there when we had our first experience. Now, what? Uh, before I get to that, I actually have a more pressing question. Were the pictures velvet, sure. uh, the Elvis pictures? Were they made of velvet? That's the big question I think everyone is wondering right yeah. now. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, there were a couple of them made of velvet. I wondered if uh, perhaps this current owner had you know, maybe been to a few concerts and got some of these Elvis super souvenirs or something at the, <laughs> at the cheap price or something. But, uh, uh, there was definitely, you know, paintings, photographs, yeah. uh, cross stitch, anything that had to do with Elvis. She was a big fan. I, the, the, the thing is, it's a funny thing. Cause a half of our audience will know exactly what I'm talking about. The other half is like velvet Elvis. What the hell is that? But the, this is a common, <laughs> this is a common thing, like into the eighties and maybe even early nineties. I, I remember there sometimes be like, big questionable vans that probably otherwise would pick up unsuspecting children in shady parts of the city. Uh, but other times right. they'd be sitting at the corner of a gas station parking lot selling velvet Elvis paintings. It was kind of like a, 
dual thing that they did. Business. They abducted children yeah. and they sold Velvet Elvises. Um, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, sure. getting getting back to the the topic of of the the haunting. So so you you get into the house. Uh, you know, obviously unsettling. You know, a little bit you know awkward kind of you know campy owner of previously having it. But but what were what, what were what, what were some of the paranormal things that started to happen that that maybe you didn't even realize are paranormal at first, but just out of the ordinary yeah. and hard to explain. Yeah, you said it right on the nose, Tony. I mean, the fact is that when the first experience happened to us, we didn't uh, relate it to the paranormal more to, well, I suppose we did, but not to a, a ghostly uh, paranormal uh, entity, but more of a, you know, what the heck was that? Uh, we don't understand what just happened. And, and what it was was a sound, if you can believe it. So my wife and I were sleeping uh, one night and we heard the most peculiar sound coming from the base uh, of our staircase heading down to the main floor and it was a it was a very strange sound that I can only explain to you by saying it sounded like an alarm clock followed by a thump so it was like ah, 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 and it went on and on and on we had no idea what this was uh, it, you know we thought well this couldn't be an alarm from somewhere because it's just you know, it starts off sounding like an alarm, but then it had that really thick bang. And it seemed to be coming from the bottom of our staircase uh, in between the drywall, between us and the the property owners next door. Now, um, that might be debunkable and explainable right there, except for the fact that the uh, owners next door had went on a trip to Mexico three days earlier and their uh, place was unoccupied. Now, the reason this turned into such a frightening, well, or, or an intriguing experience, if you will, is when we heard this sound, we were both lying in bed. Of course, we both woke up and looked at each other and, you know, uh, stared at each other for uh, a minute or so, wondering what the heck it was. But I decided to get up and investigate. And the crazy thing is that when I got out of the bed and started heading towards the staircase, the sound would continue. But as soon as I got to the foot of the staircase, or I'm sorry, the, the top of the staircase and realized that the sound seemed to be coming from down near the bottom, the sound stopped. And I stood there and, and waited for it to start up again for a minute or so. It didn't. So I went back to bed. Uh, you know, my wife and I talked about what that could have possibly been. And in the middle of our communication, the sound started up again. And uh, it went for a couple more minutes. And once again, I got a a bed to investigate and once again the sound stopped as soon as I got to the the top of the stairs this happened on a third occasion and finally uh after getting up the third time and it stopping I went down to the bottom I I went outside this was uh, about two o'clock in the morning I knocked on the next door uh the, the next the neighbors next door rung their doorbell there was no answer they were gone and I went up and went back to bed and after the third time it never happened again uh, I decided to make that the first chapter in 232 Birch of my new of of my book, and simply uh, because I just couldn't describe what the experience was. And as a matter of fact, the chapter is called the undescribable sound, uh, just because I, we couldn't figure out what it was. And in the uh, the remaining nine years that we were in that property, we never heard that sound again. Just kind of the beginning foray into the the property and and the the mystery of it. So so you never really did, other than classifying it as paranormal eventually, know exactly what was causing it. It was never debunked. It was never resolved. Uh, We couldn't, because of the nature of the way the sound was, we couldn't even relate it to anything uh, that would be mechanical or, you know, uh, uh, engine run or, or something like that. It was just such a strange, it almost seemed like, you know, there was a high pitched squeal with a, somebody banging on the wall. So it would be squeal, bang, squeal, bang. And it just, the strangest thing was getting to the top of the stairs on three different occasions and that sound stopping, almost like it was watching us or watching me. And, uh, you know, I, we had a cat at the time who sat on the end of the bed and her, you know, her ears perked up. She, she could hear the sound, obviously, too. Uh, but we never got to the bottom of it. And again, it never happened again. However, the experience that took the experiences that took place into the future led us to believe that that particular uh, incident 
probably was related to these other experiences. So take us into the future a little bit. What were some of the uh, the subsequent things that occurred in the home after yeah, that, things, that strange noise? Sure. Thing, yeah, things got a, a, a little more strange after that. The experiences uh, seemed to be more... Uh, I guess I would call them residual in nature in that, uh, you know, one of the experiences was my wife preparing dinner while I sat with my toddler son in the living room watching uh, one of his cartoon television shows. And uh, my wife swears to this day that as she was chopping some vegetables, she saw my son walk past the... uh, the kitchen out of her, you know, her peripheral vision saw my son walk past the kitchen and start heading up the stairs. And she remembers distinctly after that, uh, very soon after that, looking up and seeing my son sitting with me on the, on the couch. And she told me this, uh, uh, this story. And because of my experiences, you know, with the sound previously, and then going back to my childhood experiences, at that point, I started to say, you know, I'm wondering, you know, my wife is not going to tell me a lie like this. Uh, is her mind playing tricks on her or is this actually happening? And, you know, because it revolved around a little boy, it was very intriguing to us. So we wanted to do a little bit more research. And so uh, at that point, we didn't have any para, uh, investigation experience, uh, you know, with, that we do now. But uh, we, we really tried to... Um, uh, you know, debunk this by by saying, okay, well, maybe this was your imagination. And of course, this was a time before, um, you know, cell phones and, and uh, we weren't able to think about setting up our big, uh, you know, handy cam to, on a tripod to try to catch uh, anything on video at that time. So there wasn't a lot of investigation that took place, but uh, the future incidents also seemed to revolve around a child and that's what made us really start questioning the energy that may uh, have existed not only in the house but around our property as well and I'd have to say that probably the most frightening experience uh, would be the fact that we were we were sleeping away in that house uh, one night this would have probably been a year after uh, my wife claimed to have seen this little boy walk past and something uh, compelled me to get up out of bed and look out my my window, which uh, looked out to our backyard. And we had a small fence. Uh, it was only a, a kind of a, a knee-high fence at the end of our yard that um, cordoned off our property. And when I looked out the window, I saw a little boy standing uh, out in the pouring rain. Of course, I was on Vancouver Island in, in British Columbia, Canada, and. Uh, probably get 200 days of rain there and it rain you know some sometimes it rains sideways or it's raining so hard that it bounces up from the ground it seems like it's hitting you from from below but on this particular night it was a very nasty storm the wind was blowing the rain was very strong and I remember distinctly looking out the window uh, and seeing a little boy standing still just outside that fence of my backyard and he was wearing a white t-shirt uh, he had um, uh, sweatpants on that were clearly too small for him. You could see his ankles. And uh, he was very emotionless. He just stared at the back of our house. And, of course, I woke up my wife and I said, you know, you got to look at this. And she jumped up and she saw the same boy. And I said, you know, this boy probably is five years old and shouldn't be out in, in these elements. So I uh, told my wife to... Uh, stay at the window and I started bolting downstairs to head out the back door to you know help this little boy at this time you know when I first saw the boy we didn't think anything paranormal of it Uh, my wife actually was so concerned too that she exited the window as well and started heading back downstairs Uh, when I heard her coming I yelled at her I said go back to the window please she went back upstairs but by the time she got there the boy was gone and by the time I got to the back window the boy wasn't there anymore either so uh, this was probably, it may have taken about 13 seconds to get down from the time we saw the boy to the time I got to the back uh, door and the boy wasn't there anymore. And of course, you know, we, we want to try to, uh, you know, use our, our, our knowledge the best we can during a situation like this. And so we assumed, even though it was very uh, early in the morning and, and the way the elements were, that 
perhaps this boy's father or mother had run out in these 13 seconds and grabbed him and pulled him away. Uh, however, that, you know, that's, that's kind of what uh, makes us uh, feel that this could have been a non-paranormal experience. However, we just don't think that it was because it, the look on the boy's face was very eerie. It was almost like a residual sighting, like a tape recorder playing over and over again that this boy's energy existed there uh, on more than one occasion. It just so happened to be the, the one time that I looked out the window that we saw him. And that was uh, probably when we started to wake up and, and uh, put two and two together and say, there's something funny going on here because we hadn't experienced anything like that really in the past. And uh, after we left 232 Birch, I've lived in my house here in Alberta for about 14 years now. We've never had one paranormal experience there. So it, it really uh, showed the, the fact that this was something that was real to us. So you're, you're getting this feeling that you, your wife saw the little boy, you saw a little boy outside. What's going through your mind at this point? Obviously, you know, you're, you're initially we're trying to narrow this down as to who's the little boy that someone left to right. wander around. Well, but when, when you realize it's paranormal, yeah. did you do any digging to try to see? Is there some story to some little boy on the property, you know, that passed? Yeah. Or it, that, I mean, that, that's a good question. So, you know, the first thing I'll mention is there were, uh, let me see here, how many? There was 14 um uh, uh, townhouses they were all connected in, in that complex and nobody else had a boy of that age uh, so that was one thing that that was kind of uh, struck a chord with us also behind that little fence that we saw the little ba uh, boy standing at there was a much larger 10-foot fence that closed off the entire property so uh, we did go to each door in the complex and ask, you know, are, were you babysitting a little boy or is this a relative? No, no, nobody uh, had, had an answer for us. And I didn't really get into what I had saw. I just told them that, uh, you know, I, there was a little boy around the property. Was that somebody that you know of? And, and not one of the places said that they uh, recalled seeing or, or, or minding a, a boy of that age. So, at that point, you know, we, we didn't really know what else we could do to uh, investigate that further. Uh, it wasn't until we actually left 232 Birch that we uh, really started to dig in. We, we started checking out uh, death records for that property. Uh, we started looking into, uh, you know, asking questions about the, the new owner that took over uh, from, from that property after we moved out. And... Uh, coincidentally, that the new owner, when we spoke to them, had never had any experiences in that place. So I had to do some more research and say, okay, am I absolutely crazy here? Or what's the story? And, and then, you know, I was able to, through my research, get a better understanding of the paranormal and see maybe the reasons why this energy didn't exist anymore. Or perhaps it did exist and this person just wasn't able to uh, envision it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes this energy follows the, the homeowners. Well, I can confirm that that didn't happen with us, but there's also different factors that take place. This energy may have, uh, you know, connected to something else, disappeared altogether. Um, and, you know, I, I really didn't start diving into the reasoning behind the experience at 232 Birch until uh quite long after we had left. I, I kind of uh, kept it to myself and my wife, uh, a couple of friends that experienced things, and it wasn't really talked about much, uh, simply because at that point I was still under the impression that people would look at me as a crazy man if I told them these kind of experiences. And since I've done more research and gotten more interested with the paranormal, it's the complete opposite now. I can't wait to talk to skeptics about the paranormal because I know I'm not crazy. And I know my wife's not crazy. And since then, although we haven't uh, lived in a property that we've had these experiences, I have uh, seen uh, many intriguing things that I would call paranormal, whether they be uh, orbs, flying around different properties, or uh, we did an investigation of the Birdcage Theater in Tombstone, Arizona. And that's, uh, of course, you know, one of the most haunted places in North America. There were probably uh, about 24 murders that took place in that building in a nine-year period. And so when my wife and I investigated that property, 
we probably took about 200 photographs the first time we were there and we found uh, three anomalies, three photographs with anomalies that we couldn't, uh, we couldn't really define mm -hmm. as anything other than paranormal. Now, I've added those uh, photos into my book, 232 Birch, but the second time that we went and investigated the Birdcage Theatre, although we had some, uh, you know, when you walk into that theatre, which was built in 1881, you really feel a heaviness in there. You feel that this energy exists and that there may be, uh, you know, other, other people, whether they're uh, uh, residual or intelligent, uh, there seemed to be energy in there. Uh, we found out, of course, during our research that there were probably, uh, like I said, uh, you know, about 20 some odd murders in there. Sure. Uh, that place was used as a saloon, a bar, a, a, Bo a Bordeaux, and, uh, you know, there was a lot of activity in there. There's probably 140 bullet holes still in the Birdcage Theater today from, uh, you know, people from the Wild West shooting off guns in there. But uh, that was probably the last real serious time that I uh, witnessed something that I would call paranormal, and that was in 2014. That wraps up part one of our interview with Stephen Blackwell. To check out his books about 232 Birch and many other things, you can find his books. Just search Stephen Blackwell wherever books are sold or at Amazon.com. In part two of our interview, what was Steve's wife's opinion about the ghost boy that was wandering around their home. After they saw the little boy at 232 Birch, how did things take a turn for the dark? What did Steve's daughter see when in her bed as a small child? And how did this entity affect Steve's daughter while sleeping? And did Steve and his wife miss the ghosts after they moved out of their haunted home? Until next time, for the Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.